Before there's hope for tomorrow, we must first embark on the darkest hour. Welcome to The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. In life, strangers can be the best things that ever happen to us. Especially when you consider that most of our friends were first strangers. Paramedics and doctors that help us. Sure, we trust them, but they are technically strangers. But the word itself, it implies something more, something strange. Because sometimes the strangers we encounter are not the ones who become our friends. They are the ones who become our nightmares. The ones or the things that leave us feeling, well, strange. I've got a few stories to share tonight that I hope leave you feeling the same way. So, let's get started, shall we? In college, I spent New Year's Eve at a house that a couple of friends lived in near campus. It wasn't a huge rager, probably like 10 or 15 people, and it was a bring-your-own-beer situation. Being in college, we naturally brought more than just alcohol. It was probably an hour or so past midnight when people started to leave. Myself and a few friends were still pretty drunk, and we were probably going to be staying the night. So we just kept smoking and hanging out in the living room. Suddenly... We hear a loud bang coming from the front door. It was so loud that it cut right through the music. So we grabbed one of our friends that lived in the house to see if they would answer the door. They looked out the window, smiled, and then turned to all of us laughing, saying, It's that rollerblading lady. I knew exactly who he was talking about. She wasn't exactly his neighbor, since he didn't know which house was hers. But he, and myself, had seen her rollerblading around the neighborhood from time to time. So our friend lets her inside, and as she put it, she'd been spending her New Year's Eve getting fucked up and rollerblading around town. We actually thought at the time that that was pretty cool. We let her change her skates, and she said she needed to call her husband. She told us that she'd lost her keys while skating at some point. Fair enough, we thought. At first, she did seem cool. Maybe a little bit wasted, but who wasn't? She was asking us how college life was treating us. Normal questions. And then she moved on to excitedly bragging about her kids and her husband. Rambling, really. Their top of their class, her husband was a firefighter model. One of my friends asks her if she has any pictures of her family. So she shows us a picture of her kids, and they look nothing like her. That's probably common, but I said it out loud, just as a drunk observation. So she says that they look exactly like their dad, but she had no photos of him. No family photos from a woman who seemed to do nothing but brag about her family and their looks. Mind you, she's showing us this photo via a cell phone. Everyone has more than one photo on their phone, one way or another. For some reason, at this point, 
I started to feel a little sketched out. Not having a real reason, but I was drunk and stoned, so I was questioning if it was just paranoia. I swallowed it and maintained my composure. But then, she was starting to get too comfortable. She sat back on the couch, where she could see everyone basically, and started asking really specific questions like our full names, where we worked, not just how old we were, but our birth dates. Now it was the whole room feeling sketched out. One of my friends walked into the back room. I followed, and so did one other person. My friend said that he was worried that she was a cop, that we needed to slowly hide the drugs and to just not leave her alone in the living room at any point. So we started to take shifts, going in and out of the back room, plotting on how to get rid of her, while some stayed in the common area to entertain. During these shifts, when I was in the living room or front room area, and the others were in the back, still trying to figure out how to get rid of her, she was trying to get everyone to take shots with her. Everyone who was underage, myself included, refused and only a few people who were actually of age joined in taking the shots, mainly the people that lived in the house. She got a little aggressive when she saw that a few of us weren't drinking, and she asked very abruptly if we were leaving tonight or something. Then, she asked who was all staying there tonight. Basically, all of us were. But I just lied and said, yeah, I have to get going home eventually. She took that answer and kept pouring shots for everyone. That's when I noticed that she was pouring her shots out into the sink when she thought that nobody else was looking. Yeah, I didn't know if I thought that she was a cop, but the idea of a strange woman trying to manipulate us for unknown reasons, it really creeped me out. However, no one drinking in that moment seemed to catch on and so I was about to ask why she did that, when she very suddenly left the house. We all took note that she left her skates and her vodka, and while we were glad that she was finally gone after almost two hours, we went after her to return her skates so she wouldn't have a reason to come back. She couldn't have gone far as she'd just left the house, but none of us could find her. Eventually, we gave up, and we left the skates outside the front door. We thought leaving the vodka out was a pretty bad idea, so we took it inside and tried to forget the weirdness of the night. Later that night, after everyone must have passed out, I'm woken up by my friend who's sleeping on the floor next to me. She's now sitting up looking at me very seriously. She says that it sounds like somebody is trying to break in. And she was right. The door handle was moving, rapidly, like someone was trying to open it. And it sounded like metal scraping metal. After remaining frozen for an extended period of time, I slid off the couch and told my friend to follow me as we crawled back to the bedrooms to grab one of the guys. We found our friend, but... For the life of us, we couldn't wake him up. If he wasn't snoring so hardcore, we actually may have thought he was dead. We stayed silent and could hear somebody walking around the outside of the house. The house was surrounded by gravel and not grass. And we could hear the sound of someone walking on those rocks. It's totally that lady, I said to my friend. We both sort of grabbed each other's hands and decided to move on to another bedroom. As we are leaving this one, we froze. We see a clear shadow outline of someone trying to look in through the window. One moment later, they're attempting to open the window. Thank goodness these guys keep things locked is all I could think about as we skittered to the room next door. Our friend in this room was sleeping like a rock as well. Nothing that we could do to get him to wake up. But his girlfriend was there too, and she woke up no problem. 
Confused, she asked us what was going on. We quietly tried to explain, pointing to the windows and making shushing noises. But before we could finish, she heard the footsteps too. And she started to try and wake up our friend. Without any luck. We sat in the dark room, in silence. Sort of exchanging looks of angst. My friend says that we should call the cops. But we can't help but think about the consequences for ourselves. Alcohol and paraphernalia. They were prevalent everywhere. And it wasn't our house. What if our friends got in trouble? So we... All four of us laid in bed. Our friend's girlfriend was clenching a taser that she'd grabbed from her purse. As we listened to someone proceed to walk the perimeter and try every single window and door to the house. Eventually, they gave up. And after we felt that they were gone, we must have fallen asleep. Because the next thing I recall is it was morning and I was jolting awake. My friend and my friend's girlfriend practically did the same thing. As we were all waking up, we start to go into the various rooms and can't believe that these guys are still sleeping. The first thing that my friend says, the one that wouldn't wake up first, Dude, that lady slipped us something. Then it's just rapid fire of exchanging stories and feelings, and the three of us girls talk about how someone... Likely that lady came back last night, literally trying to break in. Our friend runs outside and sees that the skates are still there. Confused, we all sit around and we put everything together the best that we can. We come to the conclusion that anyone who took a shot with that woman found themselves feeling very drowsy, not like a drunk they'd ever felt. And then they blacked out. No one remembered how they got to their beds or what happened once they were there. But for me, my friend, my friend's girlfriend, we didn't notice anything off about the guys before they went to bed. Anyone who didn't take a shot was totally fine. So we know that she drugged my friends and that she tried to break into the house. We just aren't really clear why. It's not like college kids are rolling in the dough and there weren't any clear valuables in the house. Even the TV that she could see was an old clunky one that she'd never be able to carry on her own. And why would she want it? I guess we will never know because she didn't come back for those skates. In the three years that we remained in the area, we never saw her again. But also, what exactly did she slip into that bottle? This is a long story, but good. And as true as 33 years of time, faded memory can allow. I like to think that I do remember it vividly. Some background first. When I was in second grade, my parents got divorced and my mom moved my two brothers, my sister and me into a rental house. Looking back on it as an adult, it was a terrible place but it was what my mom could afford. The floors were uneven. The house was sided in roofing shingles. The stairs shook as you walked up, and the stove required an external propane tank. There was also a dirt floor cellar with an awesome little hiding place under the stairs. Definitely a hell house. The stereotypical house for haunting. For seven or eight-year-old me, though, it was pretty awesome. It was also my first house that didn't have wheels. My newly single mom would go on dates every weekend and would leave me with my 15-year-old sister to babysit. Though, as soon as my mom would leave, my sister would bolt off to a party or boyfriend's house. My oldest brother was 20 and would only come home when the mood suited, and my other brother... He'd always go to a friend's house a few blocks away. I was eight years old, alone in what I now know was a crappy house. 
Another important note is that there was the master bedroom, a bathroom, dining room, and kitchen on the ground floor. Upstairs, there were three rooms, my sister's room, my room that I shared with my middle brother, and the other room with a padlock on the door. Now, it's story time. I'd always heard funny noises in the house, but my mom always told me that it was just an old house, and my siblings, they never really paid any attention. But one of these wonderful Friday or Saturday nights, I was alone in the house and watching TV. I heard footsteps coming down the stairs and a child's giggle. I looked over at the stairs and there was nothing there. I hear more footsteps, nothing there. It's just an old house. More footsteps coming from the kitchen and down the stairs into the cellar. The noise stopped for a while and I settled down, just watch TV. About 15 minutes later, I hear someone running up the stairs and into the doorway leading into the living room and then they just stop. Eight-year-old me is freaking out. So is 41-year-old me remembering it. But that was it at first. Fast forward a few weeks of horrified and ignored me spending Friday nights sitting by myself while no one in the family could possibly be bothered to stay home with me. Something would always happen, and I was always told that it was just an old house or I was imagining it. And then my imagination spoke to me. Hi, do you want to come play with me? I'm bored. I didn't see anyone there, and I just thought my sister left her radio on or something. Let's play. I look back toward the dining room, and there's a little girl, about seven or eight herself, standing there. She looked vaguely like one of the kids that lived behind us, but before I could ask why she was in my house, she giggled and ran off and went straight upstairs. I ran after her. I bolted up the stairs and I saw her at the top of the landing as she ran off again, past my sister's door, past my door, and around the top of the stairs and into the third door, slamming it behind her. Remember what I said about that third door? It was padlocked shut. I ran downstairs. I didn't stop to put on shoes, and I was out the front door and around the back of the house to the detached garage to hide until someone came home. I guess the mood suited him because my oldest brother came home. At first, he was pissed at my mom and my sister for leaving me at home by myself. But finally, he asked me what had happened. He didn't believe my story at first. Who would? Until he looked up at the window to the third room. The light was on. We stayed in the garage for a while until I was okay to go back inside. During which time, my sister got home and she got one hell of an ass chewing. The three of us go inside and they leave me to sit in the living room while they investigate my story. I heard them messing with the padlock and then a loud crash. Some stuff moving around and then, oh, holy shit! Click of a light switch, slamming door, running footsteps down the stairs. And then I see my brother and sister sprinting towards me as they pick me up and we all load up into my brother's car and drove to my grandparents' house, two towns away. We told them the story, and then I heard what they found in the room. It was a lot of furniture and stuff, but my brother said that he found a picture. It looked like a little girl, the one that I'd told him about. And my sister found a rug that was stained it was either red wine or blood. She didn't wait around to find out. They just grabbed me and booked it. I never had to step foot in that house again. 
But fast forward many years, about 20 years, I had just gotten out of the Marine Corps and I was working as a corrections officer in my home state and was helping with inmate files. I noticed a familiar address. It was that house. Here's the rest of the story as I know it. After we moved out, my brother had called the police because of the other stuff that they'd found in that room, and apparently there was an investigation. The red stuff that my sister had found on the rug was a bloodstain. As this was the 80s and a very small town, DNA wasn't yet a forensic tool, so they couldn't tell whose blood it was, only that it was human. The neighbors said that the father of the family that owned the house was always drunk, they suspected abuse of the mother and the daughter. Then one day, they suddenly just left for Arizona and rented out the house to subsidize income, locking up all their furniture in that one room. The parents were arrested on an unrelated charge. After that, the house was condemned and they had to get their stuff out. But they never did find the little girl until, in preparation for the demolition, they were digging in the cellar, in my little hiding spot, under the stairs. When I was 17, I was living with an ex-boyfriend, and we'd go swimming late at night with some of our friends at a public pool, illegally. One night, my ex-boyfriend and I went to a friend's house to see if her and her husband wanted to go for a late-night swim with us. They said yes, so we packed up and left. When we got to the pool, it was about 11.30, and it was really dark, obviously, so we had our flashlights and we always had out knives for protection against wild animals. Anyways, we were swimming, having fun, talking and such. But then we heard something in the woods next to the pool. Keep in mind, the pool was a fenced-in area because it was a public park, so we felt kind of safe. When we heard the noise, we got very quiet and we listened. We didn't hear or see anything when we shined our flashlights around the woods. So naturally, we went back to swimming. I was still freaked out a bit, because it was dark and it was late. I was shining my light around the lake that was nearby, and I saw what looked like eyes standing seven or eight feet above ground. I stared at it for a good few minutes before it turned and walked away into the water of the lake. I asked my friends and my ex-boyfriend if they saw what I did, and they all said no, but that they'd heard something in the lake. To this day, I want to go back to that lake at night and find out what it was, because that was the scariest thing I've ever seen. When I was about seven or eight years old, I woke up to a strange man standing over my bed. I remember feeling very groggy and looking at him, trying to figure out if I recognized him. As my eyes got clearer, I could see that he was holding his finger to his lips in a shh manner. So I stayed quiet. He waved at me. I waved back, and then he walked out of my room. I'm not sure why it didn't scare me, other than I wasn't a very jumpy kid. 
so I fell back asleep. When I woke up, it was pure chaos. Apparently someone had broken into our house the night before. They'd stolen a bunch of our electronics, busted a couple of windows, and of course, visited my room. Naturally, my parents filed a police report. I had to give a statement about the man that I'd seen in my room. And they did eventually catch the burglars. Granted, I don't think it was due to my description. It was actually because they decided to do the same thing to our next-door neighbors less than a week later. But our neighbors had a security system. And after all of this, my family got one too. I think back to this story now as an adult with children of my own, and it truly horrifies me. Though nothing happened to me, what if? I think it was truly just the luck of the draw. So as to take no chances, I too have a security system. And I'm grateful that, so far, no strange encounters. I used to drive trucks for a living, and this is a story about the time that I almost met a murderer. Truck drivers usually have pretty specific routes they like to take due to the size of their rigs and the places that they have to go. My personal favorites over the years were routes to and from Florida. They were really nice scenic roads, and not a lot of normal travelers like to travel the long way. One year in particular, I was hurting for extra cash. So I ended up taking some new jobs. One of the jobs would be the first to take me through North Dakota. Some truck drivers like these routes, but I found them to be a bit populated. I'm not a fan for having to watch out for other traffic. Believe it or not, most truck drivers are smarter and safer drivers than the average Joe. And that makes me nervous but I was doing my best. I pulled off at a way station, deciding that I wanted to take a more isolated road. Once I found that route, I made my way. Much better at first. Not a lot of drivers at all. But eventually, I was driving down a stretch of road, and I saw what looked like a car pulled off to the side. I started to slow down for obvious reasons. And as I got closer... I could see that the trunk was wide open. I scanned the area, and I could see that no one was near the car. I passed the car at a bit of a slow crawl, and I decided that I would pull off to the side just ahead of their car. When I did this, I saw somebody quickly emerge from the bushes from my rearview mirror. But as soon as they saw my truck, they darted back into the bushes. I wasn't sure if this guy needed help or not, or if he meant harm. But I always carry a gun, so I grabbed it, tucked it in my holster, and got out of the truck. I called out, saying, Hey man, do you need some help? Do you need to use a phone or anything? But nobody responded. As I got closer, I started to examine the scene that I was walking into. Open trunk, passenger door wide open back seat had a large stain on it. Blood. I hear someone in the bushes and instead of sticking around, I ran back to my truck. I jotted down the license plate and I hit the road. I had a pretty bad feeling so I called the police to make a report. I gave the officers all of the information that I could over the phone. I was on the job and I wouldn't be back through for a couple of days. They said they'd call if they needed anything. As I made the route back home just a couple days later, I got curious and decided that I would take the same route, see if anything ever came of that area, maybe even call the police station to see if they ever found the guy that I'd reported. Outside of the nothingness of it all, you could see yellow police caution tape 
swaying in the wind. Holy shit. They actually found something. I called the police station, but I was told that a detective would call me back. By the time I hit a rest stop, I hadn't received a call, so I decided to do some research. There it was, published just two days before I was reading it. The morning after, I would have reported the car and the driver. Man's body found in ditch off highway in Richland County, suspect in custody. As I read the article, I received even more confirmation as the police stated in the article that they'd received a call from a concerned passer buyer who had seen the car with the trunk open and a man acting suspicious. Not by any means a happy story. I mean, someone did lose their life. But I was glad I made the choice to take that road because it definitely helped get that guy put away. I'm 26 now, but this story is from when I was 13, and my younger brother was about 6. Every year, usually on summer vacation, my family would take a road trip. Each trip, my dad would pick a random destination, and then we'd each get to pick something fun that we wanted to do on the way there or on the way home. Usually, I'd pick something like swimming. My mom would always pick a real touristy thing like largest ball of yarn, and my dad, the history buff, always chose something history-related. Ghost towns, old western towns, industrial towns, places with a lot of history. Not exactly museums, but places where he could be the tour guide. We live in Chicago, and this year we decided our destination would be Denver. I chose the Schlittervon Water Park in Kansas City. My mom chose Dorothy's house and the land of Oz, which is almost exactly what it sounds like. But where this trip got real interesting is when we visited the town of Dodge City. Dodge City, Kansas is an old western town that was booming in the days before railroads were up and running. Fun fact, this is the town where we get the saying, get out of Dodge from. So, we're doing our thing, walking around, allowing my dad to tell us everything he knows about the place. My little brother is between my mom and I, holding each of our hands, being a six-year-old and mumbling to himself. And suddenly, he lets go of our hands. He starts running ahead of us while shouting excitedly, Okay! As if he was responding to something that someone had said. My mom nudges me to go after him, so I bolt off. But by now, he's already stopped running and he's hopping in front of the old drugstore. He leans down and he picks something up from under one of the benches. As I run up to him and I ask him why he ran off, I tell him to grab my hand. As he does, he shows me what's in his other hand. It was one of those souvenir pennies that was flattened. It had Dodge City, Kansas printed across it and some old Western designs. My little brother proceeds to tell me that his new friend said that he would show him a lucky penny if he followed him. My parents caught up and asked my brother the same question. I couldn't wait to see their expression. My mom asks immediately after, What friend? My little brother tells my mom, I don't know. You saw us running. So my parents sort of laugh it off, thinking he's got a wild imagination. I ask my mom and dad to look at the penny, and I tell them that part of the story. My dad is fascinated and asks my brother, Does your friend live here? And my brother tells my dad, Yes, he looks like a cowboy, daddy. He looks like me, but he's a cowboy. And just as my dad starts to lose interest, my brother continues, He was locked in a closet for too long. 
and then... Lots of people didn't leave here, Daddy. Lots of people got stuck. We all sort of just walked in silence, wondering if my brother would have more to say. But that was it. Until we were leaving Dodge City. That's when my brother told us to wave goodbye. He said his friend couldn't come with us and that we had to say goodbye. As we drove away, all four of us were waving to an imaginary friend that none of us were too sure was all that imaginary. And my little brother, he never talked about an imaginary friend again. Thirteen years later, he doesn't even remember it, and it drives me crazy. But we do still have the lucky penny. My name is Gary, and this happened to me my senior year of high school. It's not a ghost story, but it's definitely the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. I lived in West Tennessee, and we usually get two or three snow days every year. The area wasn't used to so much snow, so normally a small amount could get us out for the day. This particular day should have been a snow day. But for whatever reason, the school decided the roads were safe enough, even though there were plenty of patches of ice on them. We were all annoyed, but went to school anyways. After school got out, I went to my friend John's house, and we hung out, played video games until it got pretty dark, and I decided to drive home. Mind you, the roads had gotten a little bit better, but some ice was still there. It's about a 15-minute drive from John's house to mine, but I was trying to be extra careful not to hit any ice, so it was going to be a little bit longer than usual. Leaving John's neighborhood, there's this blind hill behind you that always stresses me out because if someone came through fast, they might rear-end me. The road isn't very busy, so it's never been a big deal, but this time, a car came over the hill right as I pulled out and they had to slam on their brakes because I just pulled out in front of them, technically. In my defense, they were going way too fast, but I still felt bad. They laid on their horn and were clearly angry with me, but I gave a small apology wave and went on my way. But they remained behind me. Ten minutes later, they're still behind me and tailgating me, now with their brights on, making it even harder for me to see. I was getting nervous because they were clearly very mad and I realized by this point that they were following me. I didn't know what to do and I definitely didn't want to lead them to my house so I started taking random turns, trying to lose them. But they were right on me the whole time. Eventually, I started driving faster so that maybe I could get enough distance between us so that I could make a turn that they wouldn't see. Big mistake. In hindsight, I should have just driven to the police station. But for whatever reason, I thought this was the best idea. Going a good deal over the speed limit, I find a turn and begin to brake slightly so that I wouldn't turn at full speed. But as I was beginning to turn, I hit a patch of black ice, and my car slid off the road and into a small ditch. Crap. I didn't want to floor it because I was afraid that my car would tip over on its side, so I just sat there in disbelief, until I look into the rearview mirror and see that their car is now parked on the side of the road, with the driver and the passenger door open. Before I know it, my car door swings open, a man unbuckles my seatbelt and rips me out of my car. I really regret not locking my door because the man and his friend proceeded to kick the ever-living crap out of me, while I curled in a ball and screamed for them to stop. They just kept cussing at me and kicking until they were satisfied. They got back in their car and drove off. At this point, I was completely shaken and hurting. I got back in the car and I called my mom. She told me to call the police and that she was on her way to pick me up. 
The police arrived, but honestly, I didn't have anything to tell them, other than it was two guys in a sedan. They followed me out of a neighborhood and beat me up. It was dark, so I didn't really know what kind of car, and I didn't know what they looked like. So, the cops never found out who beat me up that night. If I had just driven to the police station, instead of trying to lose them myself, I would have saved myself a lot of pain. So, for anyone who's being followed, or thinks they're being followed, just drive to the police station. Because you never know what common maniac you might accidentally piss off on the road. When I was 12 years old, me and my family got into a bad living situation. We got evicted, and we had nowhere to go. We aren't wealthy by any means, but our family, that's different. My grandparents, to be specific to this story. So after a lot of debating and many fights between my parents and I, they decided that we were going to move in with my grandparents. Where we were living, it had one bedroom a bathroom, a TV, and two beds. Me and my sister would share a bed, and my parents would share the other. Okay, now a big thing is that we have three cats, Ginger, Angel, and Tim, and they were staying in the woodshed, which was up the hill and down a path. And to give a picture of the house, it was three stories, in the middle of nowhere, private property, and gated. There was a password to even get into the driveway, which went up a mountain and took about another 15 minutes to drive. My grandparents had workers that they paid by the hour. Blake, Sam, and Chad. I'd only ever met Blake and he was really nice. He was 20 and he had a two-year-old kid. One day, when I was going out to feed the cats, I saw a guy come out of the shed. He asked me if I needed a ride back to the house or if I wanted to walk. He said my name and told me that my grandparents had a big Christmas present coming for me since it was around that time of year. I said I was good and that I could walk. He said okay and he gave me the key to the shed. I fed the cats and then I walked back. At dinner that night, I brought up the man, and my grandparents went white. No one was working that day, and no one, other than Blake, knew who I was. The so-called Christmas present, it was real, but they hadn't told anyone about it. They had the key to the shed, and they even had the spare, which was kept under a gas can in the basement. After that, my grandparents got their guns and went out. They searched the entire property for hours, and they didn't find anyone. How did he know my name? This is the only time I had a threatening, skin-to-skin -skin encounter. In June of 2019, me and a friend had decided with our girlfriends that we were going to go camping. We finally get all our stuff loaded and get in the car and put the address in the GPS. We set off on the trip, and after three hours of driving and 45 minutes of hearing my friend and his girl argue, we finally arrive. We get out of the car and me and my friend begin unloading. After getting my stuff, I start getting my girlfriend's stuff. As I was, my friend was asking his girlfriend why she needed three bags for one night. She smiled and opened one of them. It had an ounce of weed, pre-rolls, and other goodies. 
Now, knowing that we had weed, we had to find a place to camp that wasn't near other people. It took until sundown, but we finally found a perfect spot. We decided that after we got everything taken care of, we would eat hot dogs and smoke a blunt. We started to build a campfire to light the area so we could set up our tents, but we ran out of wood in the immediate area. So I said I would go get some while my friend stayed with the girls. I set off on my journey, and after about two minutes, I found some sticks to use. I started picking up the sticks, and all of a sudden, I felt someone grab my wrist. I looked up to see a man with a blank expression. For a man, he had surprisingly long fingernails, and he was digging them into my wrist while trying to grab my other wrist. I turned my head to not see his face and screamed for help. My friends shouted a response saying that they were coming. After they shouted, I immediately felt relief in my wrist. I wasn't struggling to keep my arms down, so I turned, and the man wasn't there anymore. I turned and ran as fast as I could, terrified. I met my friends and said that we had to leave immediately. I didn't even explain myself, I just wanted gone. We load up our stuff and take the long walk back. We get to the car and load our bags in. I explained what happened as we were walking back and it scared them enough to make them want to hustle. I had a picture of my wrist immediately after, but my iPhone broke and my iCloud wasn't backed up, so I lost that picture. I do have a picture of it now, though. It has since become a scar, which shows just how much force he put on it. I'll post a picture of it on my profile for anyone who's interested in seeing it. It was absolutely terrifying. My grandpa was a police officer in a small town that he grew up in. It's not far from where we live today in Philadelphia. He was on the job for almost 30 years before he officially retired, and he truly has some of the most interesting stories I've ever heard. Though, a lot of them are funny, in the sense that he did a lot of cat rescues and search parties for lost dogs, and of course, busting up groups of pesky teens who were trying to party at the school or the park. But the best stories are the ones that actually end in a mystery. This story specifically is one that I've made my grandpa tell me time and time again. Each time, I'd come up with new questions, and over the years, I've managed to get a decent amount of information from him. I wouldn't say that my grandpa is a believer in ghosts, but he does believe in God. So in his eyes, he sees these experiences as connections to the other side. I don't know what I believe in. I just know that I believe his story, and it keeps my mind forever open to the possibility that there's something else here with us. This story takes place when he was in his 30s. According to him, he'd lived a relatively quiet life in the small town. Never even considered the idea of ghosts because... You might assume it's not a popular topic amongst police officers. It's their job to solve mysteries, and it's rare that one remain a true mystery, especially in a town like theirs. The type of town where you know your police officers and they know you, not because you're always in trouble, but because everyone was a part of the community. The police patrolled the streets that they called home, and that built trust within their community. One night, my grandpa gets a call to a house for a 1062, which is a B&E in progress, or a breaking and entering. My grandpa was a little nervous, he admitted. These weren't common calls, and he recognized the address as a home where his wife's friend and her two daughters lived. He and his partner headed to the address immediately, and they arrive in less than two minutes. The mother and her two children are standing outside on their front porch, 
My grandpa asks the mother what's going on and where the intruder is. The woman explains that they, all three of them, could hear heavy footsteps coming from above their rooms. They then heard a strong male voice yell out, saying either, you didn't say hello, or you have to go. My grandpa takes inventory of each of their faces, and they do all seem genuinely terrified. He asks the family to please wait outside or if they'd be more comfortable in the car. So after he puts the family in the car, he turns around and sees that the attic light is now on. So he and his partner rush inside, weapons drawn, and they begin to call for the intruder to step out, advising that they are armed and they need him to leave calmly. But the two only hear silence. My grandpa makes his way upstairs towards what he thinks is the attic entrance. As he does, he hears the heavy footsteps mentioned by the family. He signals to his partner to watch the attic window from outside to ensure that he doesn't slip out before my grandpa has a chance to get up there. He keeps talking, telling the man that he needs to come out, repeating, hello, hello. And he finally hears a response. I said hello. It was more like a question, but it seemed to be in response to my grandpa's hellos. He responded asking if the man heard everything that he said and if he could just come out of the attic without any further issues. He started to ask the man his name, but he wasn't getting any responses. My grandpa opens the attic entrance and makes his way up the stairs. As he does, the light goes out. He hears footsteps and looks in the direction that they're coming from. It's very dimly lit, but he sees no one. He feels someone, though, so he continues to pursue, asking questions, telling the man his name, and asking him to leave quietly, telling him the family is scared. The footsteps stop, and my grandpa hears a voice coming from somewhere, but it sounds as muffled as it did when he was downstairs. The voice says something indistinct, and though my grandpa doesn't like to assume and he didn't put anything specific in the police report, I made him tell me. What do you think he said? Sorry. I'm just sorry. So my grandpa is perplexed at this time, because he can see that there wasn't really anywhere for someone to hide up there. It was an attic, but it wasn't a storage space like some people might use it for. It had one small vanity, and literally two boxes. The vanity was more like a child's size, so it didn't offer any space for someone to conceal themselves. Finally, my grandpa heard the footsteps directly behind him. He turned around and aimed his gun, but he was aiming at nothing. But he thinks that he hears footsteps at the attic stairs. He rushes for the exit, and he makes his way down the stairs, but he hears what sounds like someone running just behind him but he keeps running. Something told him that there wasn't anyone there, regardless of what he was hearing. As he makes his way outside of the home, more officers have arrived, and my grandpa tells them that they need to do a full sweep of the house and the area. His partner saw no one leave the house or the attic window, but he did see the light turn off, and he tried to radio my grandpa, which never went through. He called for backup because he couldn't get a response, and he also thought he heard someone running through the house. Two hours, several police officers and canine units later, the search was completed. They found no one. The family ended up calling the police out for the same reason two additional times that year. Each time, it was the same except one of those times, my grandpa's partner was in the house with him, and they both heard the footsteps, and they both heard the man's voice. Unable to distinguish what he was saying, the police report reads, deep male voice could be heard, accompanied by footsteps. But 
the actual conclusion of the report was suspicious circumstances, no person or persons located, no signs of forced entry, nothing further at this time. Within that same year, the family did end up moving. As I said, the woman was my grandma's friend, and they all attended the same church. She'd asked their priest if he would come do a cleanse, something to help the house. But after he visited the home, he recommended that the family move on. I asked my grandpa, how does a priest essentially turn someone away? But as he puts it, he doesn't think that that's what the priest was doing. He thinks that the priest could feel something strong within the home. He thinks that he was trying to protect the family when he saw that his protections weren't working. I asked my grandpa why he believed that, and he told me plain and simple, because I have my wits about me, and I felt something in that house, that woman, those two children, and even my partner. And it might be an old police saying, but there are no coincidences? Well, that applies here, too. Well, friends, it appears we've reached the end of The Darkest Hour. But thank you all for listening to tonight's show. And a big thank you to everyone who shared. Be sure to subscribe to The Darkest Hour YouTube page. And join me every Friday night at 11 p.m. for a new episode right here on NeoRetroFM.com. Do you have stories like these? I'd love to share them. Send them to me. Amanda darkest hour at gmail.com and check out our subreddit the darkest hour yt stay spooky